three, two, one. Hello everybody and welcome to our E3 Hollowbagger preview. My name is Jesper Anker and today, as he's coming into picture, I'm joined by none other than David Hunter. How are you? Very well. Drinking wine tonight. Always a good sign. Gee, you got a drink? Near to me. Oh shit, too late to go now. We decided not to have a guest on today after what happened or the tragic news in Belgium, so today it's just David and I. It's been a while since it's been just David and I for a big preview, so you know what? You should enjoy it while it lasts because we have some big names listed or like lined up for the next couple of previews, so uh, enjoy it while you can. But E3 Howlbreak it. It is a great race. Oh, actually, before we get to that, why don't you talk about what you're wearing or having near you, David? Oh, no, it doesn't fit me. <laughs> there you go. There's my Hugh Gathay signed. Casual out top. And why do you have that near you? I have that in your hands. Well, we are bizarre story. Uh, I'm quite good friends with Hugh, and uh, I sent him a package of tea, believe it or not, which I think is 100% helping him to be current white jersey leader. Well, not I don't know, white jersey, the young leader classification in the World Tour race, Volta a Catalonia. Uh, in return, just arrived yesterday, just as he managed to secure a huge result, a lovely little package from uh, the Basque Country. Lots of little goodies out there for you cycling fans. Uh, maybe one day I'll raffle it off in a wee prize for you. Everyone out there is like starting to drool and be like, oh, I want that so much now. Now the Hugh Carthy put in a big result. Nice sweet bass flag there as well. Proper cycling fan now with the bass flag. Uh, but yeah, not his, not his signed jersey, folks. So maybe auction off something else, but signed jersey definitely goes in the collection. See, in a few years when he's at Team Sky and has won the Tour de France, that stuff will go for a bit of cash. It's not about the cash. It's not about the cash. But I'm so, so happy for him. Uh, I know how much he's dedicated himself over the winter. His pre-season training started in November. He... For somebody who's only 21, he is a very, very level-headed young man. He is not Carlos Betancourt, that is for sure. He just, he trains, he eats, he works really, really hard. He is super, super dedicated to the sport. Proper cycling geek as well. You know, he, he knows all the cycling stuff. He researches every stage really well. Just so happy for him. Uh, it was a big, big moment for him because start of this season is really important not just to say ride the Vuelta later on this season, which after today's result he almost guarantees, but to secure a new contract with Casual Rural or potentially to secure a contract with a World Tour team. Uh, so that was very important that he started the season fast. And if you look at some of the races, some of the riders he finished in front of today, and That's yes, insane. you know, Aru, people like that, absolutely fantastic for him. Uh, so, so pleased. So, uh, yeah. Delighted for him. Hopefully he can keep the young uh, rider classification through to the end. He should do. He's got quite a big lead over for Molo and Goodis. So big up Hugh Cathy and you'll hear him here for a Giro del Trentino preview. I was about to make that announcement too is that if you are also a fan of Hugh Cathy, he'll be on this show again because he was actually on here last year. But he'll be on here in a couple of weeks. When is uh, Giro del Trentino? It's uh, kind of April, start of April I think. Uh, so he'll be on then, and we've also got lined up for you fans out there. The flying mullet himself, Shane Archbold, will be coming on later on in the season. Uh, he's confirmed, so some proper big stars. Henderson's due to come back as well once he's fit and racing again, uh, so it's going to be fun. Well, now on the topic of that, let's just let's just finish off that topic because we also have Shane Stokes of Cycling Tips lined up for an Adens, and if you are a Dane watching this preview, you might know of Kim Plelsner, a Danish expert that's featured on Danish television many times. He's also lined up for a coming preview. So stay tuned for that. Some big names. If you thought Lee Howard and Oliver Nason were good at previewing races, stay tuned for these ones. I'm really looking forward to talking to Greg Henderson again as he was the first one on the preview show. And that was an experience and a half. <laughs> he is a character. I love Greg Henderson. Oh, I, if I was a professional cyclist, I would like him as my coach. But, you know what, that's 10 minutes of talking about the future. Let's talk about tomorrow instead, E3 Hauerbrecher. Last year, Dwayne Thomas started his classics campaign with one impressive victory in front of Snake Stibar and Matteo Trentin. Talk me through what happened last year. Well, we're back on the same climbs. 
mainly. Uh, key difference for E3, let's just get it out of the way first of all. Yes, the race is named after a motorway. Yes, that is incredibly dull, but the racing is not dull. So what they do in E3 is they, they change it slightly and we have the Paterberg before the Qualmont. So I like that. Usually it's the other way around. Uh, for those that don't know, Paterberg is the, the short, steep one. It's it's, well, Paterberg is very, very steep. It's about kind of 12.9%, 365 metres. Quarmont, 2K, 4-ish percent. So switching it and having Paterberg first really slims out the peloton. So last year, peloton hammered up Paterberg, goes to the Quarmont. Thomas launches the attack. Huge attack at the bottom of the Quarmont. Pulls away. Only Steve Ark can follow him. As they get up towards the flattish section through the middle of the, the village, Sagan puts on the afterburners and he blows everybody else away. He makes the gap and he joins the three. Such a strong three to go away. Thomas, Sagan, Stebar. Remember that Stebar was fresh from Strada Bianchi. Thomas was riding incredibly well. Sagan is, well, he's Sagan. He's always flying. The three got away. The peloton's in pieces behind. Once the peloton kind of comes together, Van Avermaet's the big loser. He's missed out. But he has teammates. He's got Oss, he had Burkhardt, he had Drucker. So they go to the front and they're trying to get them back. They, they get within, it goes out to about a minute, then it comes back to about 20 seconds and it looks like they're going to make it. And then all of a sudden Van Avermaet takes a nosedive into a gutter. Uh, luckily it was a grass verge. BMC stopped riding. Katusha reluctantly come to the front, which was a surprise because they had a couple of numbers and they had Christoph and the gap was gone. And then up front, when everybody's wondering who had the strength, Thomas just blew them to pieces. He put in a huge attack at about 3K. Very clever. He waited till Steve Barr, he, I think he recognised that Sagan was not on top form. Steve Barr was his threat. He's waited till Steve Barr's on the front. Thomas is at the back. Just as Steve Barr's pulled over to the left and Sagan's moving through, Thomas attacks on the right-hand side. So Stebar cannot go into his wheel immediately. Sagan's in the best position, but Thomas knows that Sagan is not 100%. And in that moment, it's gone. And Thomas goes on to take a fantastic victory. It was a, it was a great race last year. Uh, very exciting. And I'm expecting the same. The year before was the same. It's E3 is definitely one of the best races around. That is how the race was won. Featuring yeah. David Hunter. And Trentine finished third in the sprint. Managed to beat Christoph. Before we move on, I just saw a funny tweet coming in. They want a third camera pointing to my curtains because you can no longer see my curtains in the background. But if my curtains fall down, I think you'll notice because they're right in front of me now. But if they fall down, they will hit me in the face. So that is a fear factor right there. So watch out. If you hear a sudden knack or something, a sudden sound, that's the curtains falling down. But E3 Hardback, it's one of the races that are really exciting every year, actually, because Last year, I think people thought that, or I did as well, that Game Bevel Game was much better. And you think it's going to happen again this Sunday, that Game Bevel Game is going to be much better. But I guarantee you that E3 is some of the best racing you'll see this week. And I would not have your hopes up for Ghent compared to this race. So you have to pick a race, Ghent or E3. E3 is normally the race that delivers. Have you had a chance to look at the weather forecast yet? Looks like it was raining today. So cobble should be greasy and then it looks like it should rain tomorrow morning and it should clear up for the rest of the day. So we should have still possibly some wet cobbles, bit of wind as well, not, you know, 60 kilometres per hour wind. We're talking gusts of 20, high 20s, crosswind for a lot of the day. So it's an interesting weather forecast. It's probably going to have a small impact on the race. And it's changing from day to day. Uh, a good friend of mine, Sylvan M in the chat, he's a weather student, he provided me with some weather forecast pictures, very thank you, thank you to you. Uh, he says, or he predicts that the weather is going to be about 30 to 40 uh, kilometers per hour, and last year again it was 80, so you can uh, kind of compare it to that. I think it's going to have a big impact because it's going to be crosswind almost the entire day out here, so in the end, I think we're going to see very split peloton at least. With that in mind, Back on the fittest. This is actually this is this is cobblestone racing at its finest. Uh, what we saw in Vastor Vanderen, the final forty kilometers were very exciting, but the finishing at 
kind of an anti-climax when Greg Van Arama was caught near the line. But I mean, Picard made up for that with a premature celebration, which was really funny. But seeing a, that big of a bunch sprint in a cobblestone race just hurts my eyes. What do you think? Yeah. Not a fan of that either. It's... The Wilds of Landrum was a weird race. It just didn't get going for me. The the big break went away. It didn't feature any of the main riders, but there was a lot of teams represented and it kind of nullified a lot of the good climbs. In fact, because there was a couple of groups before the peloton, we didn't even see the peloton doing the main climbs, uh, which was disappointing. Benut clearly on form. Van Avermaet went for the attack very, very close. It was a good attack, but for me, it just didn't deliver. Maybe it was too nice a day. I think... I think it did deliver for me. I had my adrenaline pumping the entire way through. It's just the final kilometer, right after when Greg Van Arma got caught, the race is kind of ended for me, and that's not a cobblestone race. But let's let's talk about the start list. We got Tish Beno here, a, la a late minute addition to the race, and clearly he's the strongest rider, or one of the strongest riders with Greg Van Arma at, at this moment in time. But the way that he rides these races, can we talk about another inclusion to uh, riding with my head on the team bus? No. Uh, really? No. No, no, no. I mean, Dwarso Vanderen, yeah, the team won. So, Lotto are going to be delighted with what Teach uh, did. His attack was good. Uh, he, you know, he was looking strong. He probably made the move at the right time, I think. He couldn't quite get away later on. He kept trying, but it just didn't work for him all the time, knowing that they had in the peloton, in their opinion, the fastest sprinter, and he turned out to be the fastest sprinter. So, for Lotto to have riders willing to take a chance and sacrifice their own chances for others is, is, is a big thing. And you cannot criticise them, especially when the team uh, took a, a very important victory. Uh, yeah, he was very attacking, but it worked. Team won. But if, if the Busher hadn't won that stage? If the Busher hadn't won that stage, then we would maybe be asking a few questions. But he did win that stage. I guess he got lucky there. I guess. If Kakar hasn't hadn't raised his arms, I think it'd been another story. But Benu, clearly the strongest guy at this moment in time. Just seeing him start attack and attack and attack, it's so impressive at him at such a young age, being able to go out there and enforce these kind of rules. It kind of reminds me of a younger Cancellara just going out there, being the first one to really break the peloton. And why was he a late addition to this? Do we know why he was added late? Uh, I think he was probably always going to do it. A lot of us struggling. They've lost a few riders due to injury crashes, unfortunately, with motorbikes. Uh, so looking at the initial stat list that they put forward, I did have doubts because I fancied either Benut or De Boucher to, to be starting. And that is the case. So I, I think he was always going to be racing that race. I don't know for 100%. I, he, he hasn't told me if that was the case, but I think he was always going to be riding. Also worth mentioning, Jürgen Rolands was, uh, before Benu was added to this, there was a press release from Lotto saying that he's the main leader, they're going to be working for him. And also Yella Valles, who was actually really strong in Duasto Landron for a big portion of the race before he faded near the end. So two riders to watch out for, Lotto Sudal, if Tish Benu doesn't get away in an attack. But when we talk E3 Hallbag, we have to talk about the king of E3, which is Tom Bonin. You're on the first second page and you see former winners. You see that Tom Bone won in 2004, 2005, 2006, and so on. I mean, the list just goes on. What are his chances of winning another E3? Mm. Breaks my heart to say it, but I think it's slim. I think Bonin's... The king is dead. Long live the king. I think he's, I think he's on his way out. Now, I said the same about Contador for our Catalonia preview. <laughs> How dare you? How dare you? <laughs> and I, I have been proven incorrect. Uh, for me, Bonin is no longer the, the, the man he was. Uh, doesn't pack the sprint that he used to, which is hugely important because a lot of the wins he got from a reduced bunch sprint, he doesn't have the pace anymore. And ethics are having to evolve and are having to change their tactics uh, to adjust to that. Very impressive ride by young Mr. Gaviria uh, yesterday. Didn't have the legs for the sprint, but I did mention he is the, the next Tom Bonin, and what I watched from him on Wednesday fully justified that title. Bonin is here. He's not the main leader. They have Stibar, they have Terpstra. For me, Bonin isn't even their man for a sprint because they've also got Trentin. They've got Wisniewski. 
boring for me. Last season, he's not in the same form, say, a Cancellara is for his last season. I think Boonen is going to go out with a whimper. Cancellara is going to go out with a bang. See, I can spoil this already, but he's not even on my star list. As much as it hurt me in E3 to not have him on my star list, I just couldn't find room for him. And on the same team, Trenton was third last year, and Trenton has shown increased form in this, in, like, this season, last season. And I think that a race like this, if he can find the right move, he's got to be the man to beat. Along with Steeper, of course. Niki Terpstra was working for Gaviria in uh, Vastor Vanner, which I think surprised quite a few. Because when you said that Gaviria was the new Tom Bowden, I thought it was sarcasm, honestly. <laughs> I'm not sure how many believed in Gaviria being the next Tom Bowden. There's so many were talking about Cavendish instead. So Gaviria, quite the bike rider himself. Yet again, yeah. back to the business. I'm what I do want to mention about Ethics and Lotto, because we talked about them on Tuesday night, and I was saying how Lotto had dominated the first couple of races, and they went on to dominate Wednesday as well. They, they rode a perfectly, uh, perfectly good tactical race, and they took the win, which is important, because they hadn't won uh, Umlu Perkerna, so that was really good for Lotto, and they dominated. Ethics, again, a shadow of their former self. Uh, didn't hit the main brakes when they did hit the brakes. It was with riders who were never going to win. Uh, Terstra brings back the Granab uh, Van Avermaet attack. Gavria fades in the sprint. So it wasn't brilliant from Ethics. Now I'm looking at the teams for E3. So World Tour race. This is a, a proper start list. We have talent from just about every single team. Narrowing it down to nine riders for stars is incredibly difficult. Ethics have a stronger team than Lotto for me. I think Ethics are going to go back to being the dominant force for this race. Maybe not for the rest of the classics, but certainly for this race, they, they are stronger. Bonin, Kaiser, Tony Martin, Stiba, Tetra, Trentin, Vandenberg, Wisniewski. That is a strong, strong team. Trentin will be held back. He'll be held back for a, for a sprint uh, because in this race... Whether we get a breakaway or a sprint is very finely balanced and really does depend on how many numbers teams have after the Quamont. So I think Trentin will be held back. They have Terstra, they have Stebar, they have Bowman, who can all attack. Ethics are looking very, very strong. See, this is kind of like Russian roulette. Pick the right Ethics guy that's going to win E3, or at least have the best shot at winning E3. It's going to be very difficult because there are quite a few. Tinkoff Sachs, or just Tinkoff as they are named now. We have both the Sagan brothers. And then my outside pick for E3, Oscar Gatto. He was so strong in Vastor of Lander. I was really impressed. He, I think he finished like 8th or something in the end. He could have gotten... He finished 7th, sorry. He could have gotten away and he could have won that. If it hadn't been a bunch. But if he had attacked with Greg Van Aramat, he would have won that race on the line. What do you think about their team? All for Sagan. Uh, Sagan arrives... Okay, he's not won yet this season. But I have been so impressed. So impressed by Peter Sagan. I do believe he would have won Milan San Remo if Gavaria didn't crash. Yet to win the world champion jersey, not a huge concern because his form has been so, so strong. I mentioned before, I think for most of the early part of the season, he's only operating about 90% and he's still finishing second place, which kind of tells you everything you need to know about the talent that he has. Last year, he was close. He ended up getting blown away by the Thomas attack. He wasn't quite at the level. Uh, the big question is, is he up to 95% yet? He, he will be saving the 100% for Flanders, for Roubaix. So is he at 95 Because if he is at 95%, it's going to take something strong to stop him. He, he is so, so good. Uh, the attacks will fly. Paterberg, Quarmont. We've seen it before with Sagan. He's not, I want everybody to watch him at the start of the Quamont. He's not good at the beginning. Uh, he cannot follow the attacks. He never usually goes in any of the earlier attacks on the Quamont. Once we get up into the flat section in the village, there is nobody better than him. He can make up a massive gap on, say, last year it was Thomas and it was Stebar. This year it could be, could be anybody really, but I, I do see Sagan being there in that elite group at the end of the Quarmont. And if we have the right mix of riders, if we have the big teams represented, then they don't come back. And if we have a sprint from six men, I don't see anybody there being faster than Sagan. Well, the next guy we're going to talk about could be faster. But before that, 
I get pictures, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm getting pictures of Richmond, one of the final laps where people were attacking left and right, and I remember Greg Van Avermaet and Sagan going up together, and they were distanced by quite a lot, but they actually rode back to that front group, which then came together as a peloton. And so if you want to go look, go back and look at that, that's one of the good scenarios I can remember of Peter Sagan not following the initial attack, but making it up afterwards. That's the kind of rider he is. And with the sprint he has, he can afford to not be in that first group when they go off the front. But Greg Van Avermaet, his last three victories have all been in front of Peter Sagan. So if you're talking about a guy that can beat Sagan, this guy has the statistics to prove it. Yes, but not in a flat sprint. Uh, he beat him in Umloop, he beat him in Terreno, which was uh, uphill sprints. Flat sprint, he's not faster than Sagan. Van Avermaet, as we mentioned for our Dwarves of Landon in preview, Van Avermaet is hitting a massive purple patch in his career right now. His attack was hugely impressive, very clever. A rider who we've accused before of not being the best tactically. He got it spot on in Dwarves of Landon. Well, Almost Close enough. I mean, it was about 300 metres short of being spot on, but it was the right move to make. My problem with Van Avermaet is the Quamont. He is not the best on the Quamont. He, for whatever reason, uh, which is strange because he is good in cobbles, he doesn't cope well. He never seems to make it with the elite group. So what Van Avermaet has to hope is that his team are able to bring them back. Last year they probably would have, but then you're towing Christoph and faster riders so I think for Van Avermaet, we've got two perfect scenarios. Either for a change, he can actually get up the Quamont as fast as Sagan and Co., which I find I don't think will happen. Or secondly, they keep the gap close. He has his trusted team again, Burkant, Os, Drucker, three very strong riders who will be there after the Quamont to pull Van Avermaet back towards the front. And then when maybe the gap's about 10 or 15 seconds, Van Avermaet bridges across. There is no way he wants to bring with him any sprinter. So they can't just tow the group and bring everything back together because the last kind of 15, 20 K is flat and very, very hard to get away. So Van Avermaet to win, either he has to go with the attacks on the Quammer, which I doubt, or get close enough with the, the, the strong team he has and then bridge over and hope that nobody else can go with him. But still he has the problem of Sagan. He's one of the riders who's going to stop other people from uh, winning. The other one we've not mentioned yet is happens to be a little rider from Switzerland who just happens to be in uh, good form as well, who is also a faster sprinter, I think, in a flat sprint than Van Avermaet. You think Cancellara is faster than Greg Van Avermaet? Flat sprint after a hard day, yes. Well, I guess you have Milano San Remo back in that up, where he actually has won before in a sprint, so Cancellara definitely fast. See, I, a couple of years back in a sprint, I do remember. Mm -hmm. But see, I asked you this for Dwarfstor of Lennon and I asked Oliver Nason too. When does the real racing pick up in a race like this? Is it at the Eichenberg again with about 60 kilometers to go, I think it is? So big fans of the Tannenberg and it was great to see Edward Toons lead up the Tannenberg. I really enjoyed that. Uh, we're talking 90k to go on the Tannenberg, so it's, it's not going to be the kind of huge point in the race. Eichenberg uh, is still way out as well. For me, it's going to start, properly start, on the Paterberg, which is 45k to go. Now, by that point, the peloton will have accelerated into many climbs. It won't be huge, uh, but for me, Paterberg is where it starts. And then we have that bang, bang, Paterberg, Quarmont. There's only a couple of kilometres in between them. Uh, and in between them, we've got some fairly exposed open roads. And then we have to turn around and see who's left. That's when you'll see it. Depending on who gets away, the brake could make it. Depending on who's chasing, the brake might not make it. It's, it's a very finely balanced kind of decision to make. And it all depends on who's around, who's there to chase, uh, and is there a will to chase. So last season, a lot of people were frustrated because Katusha did not commit to the chase until it was too late. Jumbo had a few riders, they didn't commit to the chase. Uh, so, it, yeah, sometimes there's no logic in cycling. Sometimes it just happens because it happens, which is one of the beauties of cycling. Oh, it really is. It's, it only really happened here in the cobble races, where there's so much chaos with even 60 kilometers to go, and that's what makes these races so interesting and so fun to watch for us spectators. But you say they look back and they see how many riders are left from the team. If you look at the Trek Segafredo team, I can see Stoyven, I can see De Volder, 
harassed? Is that all he's got, Cancellara? Cancellara won't be looking back. Well, that's a, that's a good way of putting it. Guarantee you he's not looking back. Now, Stuyven is a good backup plan in case things go wrong. You saw what he was like in Milan San Remo. Cancellara, as they say in cycling, is leaving everything on the road in these races. He is going all in to win races. He was very unlucky in Milan San Remo. Trentin covered his late attack, which would have won the race. Here, he will go on the, the... Well, he will probably get somebody to set a fast pace on the Paterberg. Uh, I remember a few years back in Flanders, him blowing Sagan away on the Paterberg. Uh, Cancellara is very good on that climb. One little note, in Flanders, the gutter they can't use because they put the holdings on it. They've got to go up the centre of the road. Here, the gutter is available, so it's not quite as hard. Uh, they don't have to go in the, the cobbles. Quamont Cancellara will, will go, and he will take with him whoever is strong enough to cope with his pace. And then we will just have to see. I'm thinking Cancellara will be there. I'm thinking Sagan will be there. I'm thinking... A few guys from Team Sky who we've not talked about yet could well be there. Vermaak might be there. We could have a group of six, and if we get a group of six, then the the peloton has no chance. But well, see, you even say Cancellara is faster than Greg Van Avermaet. For Cancellara to win, he needs to go solo, in my mind. Or at least be with one other rider. There's no way he's winning from a group of three, because if it's a group of three, there's at least going to be one guy faster than Cancellara. And then it has to be a really, really, really tough day for Cancellara to outsprint one of these guys. That's and my two cents on him. The problem for everybody is Sagan. That's, mm -hmm. that's your issue because it's almost inconceivable considering his form just now that Sagan won't be present in whatever group. However, think back to last year, group of three, Thomas puts in the big attack. If you are that strong on the day, you will win. And Cancellara is very, very close to being that strong. It really does depend on how strong Sagan is to match him. Let's move on to Team Sky. They don't have Durant Thomas here. He is in Catalonia riding off the back for some reason. So here they have Ian Stannard and Luke Rowe instead. I remember I mentioned Luke Rowe quite a lot for Omlu and Pirna. And look at what a result he put up. Could he do something here in E3? Love, love the look at Team Sky. Uh, they... There's not really a, really a hope for them for a sprint. Yes, they've got Viviani, but they are all in for a break. A lot of teams come with a sprinter and a breakaway artist. So we just talked about Trek there, Cancellara, Stuyven for the sprint, Lotto, Benut, uh, Rollins for the sprint. Sky are all in break. They've got Rowe, they've got Stannard, they've got Kwiatkowski. They have three very, very strong options. Rowe, you mentioned yourself, Tannenberg, absolutely destroyed the field in Umbro. I mean, we know he's strong, we know he's a good rider, but that was that was huge. Stannard did not ride the early races, defending champion in Umlut, going for his third win, didn't ride it, didn't ride Kerner. Different route in for Stannard this season because they want him to be better for Flanders and Roubaix. So there is a slight question mark over where he will be right at this minute in time. But in Rowe, they have somebody who is extremely strong. And then Kwiatkowski, bold in Milan San Remo, uh, unlucky because he was caught with about 1.5k to go. He can handle this. We've seen him before. We've seen him in Duas de Vlander in last season. He he knows these claims well. He can do it. Sky look very, very strong and they are all in for a break. So there are quite a lot of teams who want the break to succeed. That's not the best news for sprinters. Let's play a little game here. Because Salvatore Puccio is in this race. How many mechanicals will he have in E3 Harbeck? <laughs> I'm aiming at at least four. He's such a good rider as well. I mean, in Strada, he was... I know it's, it's kind of it's his home and his family are there and his extra motivation, but boy, dude, what a fighter. What a fighter puts you as. I had a lot of respect for him. I think he is one of those underrated riders. Really, yeah. Never destined to be a domestic, a hell of a good domestic. Uh, but yeah, I'll go for two mechanicals. I loved his fighting spirit that day. I would have been so pissed because he really had a shot at winning that. He was in the front. He was looking so good. Or at least pay he was out there as a satellite rider. His domestics roles were almost up. And then you have like five mechanicals in one day and it's out of your control. I'd be pissed. Didn't even do the bike throw. I thought we were yeah. dead for the... A the Jack Bauer bike throw in the gutter. Best bike throw of all time had to be Wiggins a few years back in... I think it was Terreno, wasn't it? No, it was Terreno, where he, he threw his bike and it gradually just rolled to a halt and leaned against the wall, which was uh, 
phenomenal. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I remember it completely. I just thought it was the Giro, like one of the stages there. But yeah, that was definitely one of the better ones. Only Wiggins could do that. So, man is class. We earlier, or a previous preview, a few days ago, we mentioned Seth Van Marken not being at these important races. Now, he's finally showing up. And have you heard any news about his form, shape? Nothing. Nothing. These Dutch boys keep it close to their chest. Uh, will be very interesting to see if his change of of route into this race has has made a difference. Last season, I do remember, he was very attacking. I think he drove into the Paterberg at the front and then he had to unclip because he misjudged the corner. Classic Van Mark. Yeah. Uh, and then he just never kind of got going again. This, If we're looking at him, I really hope he does something. He's such an attacking rider. Fans want to see him do well. It's been a while since he, he took a big win. He will be up against it because of the number of strong riders, but he also has a very fast sprint from a small group. It would be good to see him have no bad luck throughout the race. Let's see what he can actually achieve with a level playing field against other riders. Uh, however, I'm thinking Stannard, I'm thinking Van Mark, I'm thinking that Flanders and Roubaix are really their ultimate goals, and maybe they aren't quite at the same level as the Van Avermaets and the Cancelladas just now, but it's Van Mark, it's Cobbles. If we get the bad weather that your friend is telling us about, then it will really suit him. If it's windy, uh, it really will become a race for Van Mark. Remember, Gent Verligan from last season, how good he was, so bad weather would certainly favour Van Mark. See, I'm not even going to joke about mechanicals in Van Marke, because it's no longer a joke. It's so sad. He's so talented. When the focus group and I were discussing our first cycling teams, half of them left out Van Marke saying that he doesn't have it anymore, but that's not true. He would have so many more... His results or Palmares would be stacked if he hadn't had so many punctures, so many mechanicals and crashes for that sake. Just go back and look at his fights against Fabian Cancellara. He has the talent. He just needs the equipment to work as it's intended to be. We already mentioned Alexander Kristoff briefly. Last year, he won everything. Can you do it here? He is, isn't he on the level of Sagan? Like, not quite there, but he's close to him. Do you know what? The last couple of weeks have been disappointing. He started the season so well uh, in the Far East. He didn't manage to win Paris. And at any stage in Paris Nice, he was poor in Milan San Remo. He claimed he was uh, poor positioning. Certainly, Marco Halla crashing had a big thing to do with that. But we did point out in the preview that no Luca Paolini is a huge loss for Van Ma uh, for Christoph, sorry, not just in Milan San Remo, but here as well. Paolini is was one of the best domestics you can get in the cobbled races. Without him, they do not have a ready made ready made replacement. That's that's not criticism because Paolini is one of the best riders in the world. Yes, they have big strong riders like Bistrom, but they don't have the experience or the guile of a Luca Paolini, so Christoph's going to find it hard. Nobody wants to take him to the line. The best form of defence, I think, for Christoph would be to attack. I, th I would love to see him go with the elite group that breaks clear on the Quamont. That would really scare them. Uh, it would really stop them from working. So What he did in Flanders with Nicky Terpstra-ish? Exactly. Exactly what he did in Flanders. You know, He's got to go and attack them. He suffers from the same problem as Degenkolb and that nobody wants to take him to the line in a kind of smallish five to ten man group. Degenkolb has countered that in Paris Roubaix by attacking off the front, uh, and Christoph did the same in Flanders. So I would love to see Christoph ride a, an aggressive race because he realizes he has a lack of teammates. He might have to rely on BMC to drag him back towards the front, and they're not going to be happy to do that. So hopefully Christoph can go in the attack, and that would really throw a spanner in the tactical works of Cancellara and Sagan if Christoph is there in the, the top group of five. So you mentioning Perry Robert, I get tears in my eyes because Evil Empire is actually out for quite a while now because his girlfriend hit him with a shopping cart when they were out shopping. He has Achilles and it's actually pretty bad. And if you watch Perry Robert last year, Evil Empire did so much work for Smith D bar. He was following attacks left and right. He spent all his energy just covering attacks and he really had a shot at winning that year if he wasn't a domestique at Ethics Quick Step. And he's actually out for quite a while now because of his uh, Achilles injury. That is one of the best injury related stories I think I've heard. No, it's just so sad. I mean, the guy's got talent, and this is the time of year where he's supposed to shine, and then 
You know what? We need some milk today, honey. Oh, crap. I hit your heel. Oh, no, 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 no. <sighs> Jens Kukuleri. Last of Landrin, fifth place, and showed up. That's all he needed. A bit of us saying he was finished, he was over. A bit of extra motivation for Jens Kukuleri. Now, I hate to rain in this parade, but Dwazdo Vlanderen and E3 are not the same race. They're not as big as each other. You compare the start list to Dwaz, you compare the start list to E3, it's not the same. Uh, we were missing, you know, Cancellara, Sagan, Christoph, Stiba, Stanard, Roe, Van Mark, Van Mark, you know, Ben, uh, sorry, Demar. So it's not the same start list. Let's see if he can continue on. I'd be pleased with him. I really would. You know, I've talked about him for a, a number of years now about how good a rider he is. I've interviewed him. He's a lovely guy. Uh, I'd be pleased to see him do well. How about Turbo Durbo? See, that was a surprising factor for me in Vastor. No, I, he's, he's, he's a rider who gets better and better every year. He did a very good ride in Strada the year before. Uh, becoming stronger on the cobbles as well. He's just a big unit. You know, he's strong... Perfect rider for these types of races to send out on a, a kind of breakaway. Uh, I would expect to see something similar from him in this race. Without Heyman, he really has to step up into almost a kind of second leadership role. They have also Magnus Court if it comes back together for a biggish sprint, which it probably won't, but you know, Court is there anyway. He's another one who's good in these conditions. Uh, so Orica look okay. I think being like a World Tour race, they will struggle. See, guys, I know we're dragging on, but you know what? This start list is so stacked that I feel like since it's only David and I today, we can actually go through a lot of the favorites before we go on to the star section. My, I don't usually do betting tips because that's more of David's alley, but Scott Thwaites is at 300 to 1 at Paddy Power, and if you look at the recent results he's had, I'd say that it's it can happen that Scott Thwaites finds his way onto the podium. If you look at the injuries, Cancellara crashed out last year of E3, so... 300 to 1 for a guy this much in form, I think that Scott Thwaites could be in that front group when Cancellara goes off the front. No kidding. What do you think? Could be. Very impressive rider just now. It was good to see him continue in that form in Dwarves of Landerin. Uh, notice that there's no Sam Bennett either for Bora, so they're not going to have a sprint option. Thwaites is a, a rider who's in form, who's underrated, and could well make that front selection. Very underrated. Are not the mar of FD Shay. Now, after his victory, his brilliant victory at Milano San Remo, he was accused of getting a ride, kind of like uh, Eduardo Sepulveda in the tour. Just he didn't do it. Could he actually win here at E3? Because from what I remember, he's actually a pretty good cobblestone rider. Very competent cobblestone rider. Uh, before his dreadful season of last year, you know, he was up there in classics. He was expected to turn into a classics rider. Roubaix has always been his dream, being a Frenchman. Uh, he can cope really well with uh, cobbles. He can cope with bad weather. His form this season is outstanding to take. A win in Paris-Nice to take Milan-San Remo. Demar is obviously in the form of his life. No way should you underestimate him here. He can go in a smallish break. He's done that before in these races. He will probably wait for the sprint, I would imagine, and hope that people can bring it back. FDJ themselves are also quite an underrated team in this type of environment. They have Johan Labon, who also is in very good form just now, and he can last the distance in this type of race. Uh, so I'm hoping demand goes well because I like him. Talented rider who is having a renaissance. Last rider before we move on to our star selection, and this is a rider that we made fun of in our previous preview in Vastor. Oh, well, we mentioned him with a bit of sarcasm. Kipo Pizzato. Third place, I think he finished in Vastor, actually. He finished fourth, close enough. I mean, we, made, we did make fun of him, laughing, saying his name. He is on form. E3, it's kind of up his alley, isn't it? I know he finished fourth. I know he finished... What was it, eighth in San Remo? I think it was. Yes. I'm not going to sit here and say Pizzata's going to do well. You're I'm not? not that, I'm not having it. You're not falling for that trick? No. No, I'm not. I'm, Why not? What's the reasoning behind that? He's a He rides for a rubbish team. 
Uh, he's only there because of the coverage that he brings. Yes, he eventually ended up doing okay because the bunch came back together and he has a fastest sprint. Uh, if he goes top 20 here, I'll be impressed. Top 20. You hear it here first, guys. Top 20 Pio Pizzato. Let's go on to the thing you guys have all been waiting for, the star list. And Dave, you know what? Since you usually go first, I'll go first today. I have in my one star list, and this is blasphemy because I've always had Tish Benoit like three stars when we're doing these previews, but Tish Benoit at one star, I feel like he's really lacking that final like strategic move where he attacks and then waits if it doesn't work and then follows another attack instead of instigate every single attack he's in because he has the form. He just needs to trust the race that it will like unfold the way he wants it to and not always be at the front. It's kind of the same thing that uh, Scott Thwaites suffers off being the guy to attack every single time. I've also have Luke Rowe on here, one star rider. I think he's very capable. I'll pick him over Ian Stannard. As you mentioned before, Ian Stannard is uh, targeting later races and Luke Rowe is right here now. And then uh, the pick from left field, Oscar Gatto. I just, what I saw in Glassdoor is really, really good. And one star riders are supposed to be jokers, super jokers for that sake. And Oscar Gatto fits into that category. He can attack away, he can follow Kanchlara on a good day, on a very good day, and then he can sprint in the end. Let me hear your one-star riders. Demar, Van Mark, and I agree, Benut. So, Demar, a one-star, do you think he can follow these tough attacks of the Quaramont? No, I think he'll wait for a sprint if we get a sprint. So, I've tried to balance my star list to have some sprinters and some breakaway experts because it is finely balanced between uh, the two scenarios. So, Van Mark, I just like him. I'm a big fan. Benut, uh, we will mention again that he's not uh, yet to win a race. Uh, we will continue to do that until he wins a race. So please, teach. can you please take a race soon so we stop after saying you've not won a race yet? Please, teach. Uh, I agree with your Van Mark pick, but I have more faith in him. I'm at two stars. When you, are that, when you go radio silent, there's a reasoning behind that. And he's going to be on fire, I feel like. I feel this is, this is going to be his season. It's going to be his comeback. I had a feeling for Anod Demar earlier this season. And you know what? That came true. Seth Van Mark, it's his time to shine. I also have Fabian Cancellara in a two star. Because <sighs> I know he's supposed to be three star. But if you look what? at the quality of riders that I hear in this race, he has to be two stars. This is not... The first time I've done this, I think I did it for Strade Bianchi as well, putting him at two stars. Did he win the race? Just yeah, he did, and I made a mistake. But this <laughs> time, I did not. Because to be able to win E3, you need to be able to attack and sprint. And the three guys I have at the three-star riders can all attack and sprint. And they're better at that than Fabian Cancellara. Cancellara has to win from a one-man group or two-man group. That does not happen. I also have to make Stivar of Etix here. He can sprint if it comes down to a reduced group. Just not really, uh, his, his lack of form is kind of a thing of wonder. Like, he was really, really good in Tirreno, and then he's kind of... Wait, I heard he crashed into a dog. Is that actually true? He did. Yeah, I know. He that, did. that might have been why he finished so far down, but, you know, what well, could have been, but it, it didn't happen. Let me hear your two-star riders. Stiba. Yeah. Van Avermaet. Stanard. Ian Stanard. Even though he, he could be targeting Flanders for a bit. Yogi's a beast, what can I say? Uh, we've not seen what he can do yet this season. He's been riding domestic uh, for the boys over in the big races. He will come here hungry. We remember from Umloop what a tremendous rider he is. Uh, yeah, don't go underestimating Yogi Stannard. It's tough to pick a rider from Sky, just as it's tough picking a rider from Etix. There's so many to choose from. It's like a kit in a candy store. Three-star riders, all riders that can sprint and attack better than... Fabian Cancellara, also known as Spartacus, Greg Van Avermaet, the guy to beat right now. He is so informed, he's so confident in himself. He is the strongest rider in this field, in my opinion. Peter Sagan, the guy we mentioned again and again and again during this preview. He is the danger man in case it comes down to a reduced sprint. And Alexander Kristoff. Last year he won everything. He is probably the fastest man out of this group behind Sagan. And he's not afraid of attacking. I think he will try to follow these attacks. But of a group of... Let's say four, five. Let's say five finishing. With uh, I'll wait for my winner until you go with your three star riders. Christoph has to be three stars because he's the fastest sprinter in the race and he has a very good chance of surviving all the climbs. He could go in a, a late attack or he could wait, depending on the situation, for a sprint. In which case, he should really win. Yes, Trentine beat him last year, but it was 
only for third. Uh, Christos sprinting for a win is a different rider altogether. And then we have the two best riders in the world who are heads and shoulders above everybody else. And that would be Sagan and it would be Cancellara. So you have Cancellara at three stars. Just, just quickly for the chat, why does he go at three stars when I have him at two stars? Because currently he is the best rider in the world. Uh, mentioned before, his figures from the Algarve TT, he won Strada Bianchi, he was very impressive in Terreno riding for other people. Cancellara is in potentially the form of his life and he is one of the best riders of the last 10 years. So for me, Cancellara has to be a three-star rider for just about every single race he does this season. Interesting, very interesting. We'll see when we get to the Tour de France when you have Fabian Cancellara at three stars. I'll he's just Giro. He's doing oh, he's Giro instead? Well, technically there are three time trials, so it's not out of the question. Open but, that time trial, pink jersey for Cancellara. We're going to see Greg Van Avermaet win E3 because he is the man to beat right now, in my opinion. Looking at his confidence, looking at form, looking at how the race is going to unfold. He's not afraid of attacking. He's not afraid of sprinting in the end. He's got confidence. He's going to go out and he's going to win off his, a group of five at the time. What do you think? Sagan for me, uh, really impressed with how he's going this season. I know he's not taking the win. I know people make fun of him, which is a bit harsh considering what a talent he is as a world champion. I think we'll get a relatively big group going over to Quarmont. We're talking Cancellara. Given the bad weather, we're probably talking Stiba, uh, Nicky Terstra, maybe Benut as well. We're, we're looking at a, a real elite group and then it will slim down a bit even more with the attacks. And I think Sagan will be able to follow Cancellara. I see the two of them coming to the line together and I see Sagan win. Interesting. So on that note, guys, we won't quite leave you here because I did promise that we'd answer some of your questions. So if you have a question right now, hit us up on Twitter. It's at CyclingMole at CyclingHubTV. And we'll answer them right here. You already heard our predictions and how we think the race is going to unfold, but we'll just be nice and we'll answer some of your questions. So at Ironsore asks, what's the impact of Ben Vevelgem or even Tour Flanders for the matter on this race? You mentioned it a bit earlier with guys like Van Marke and Ian Stanner, but try and... Uh, elaborate on this question. The change in route for Ghent Velligame is, is hugely significant for this race. Ghent Velligame is usually the sprinters race. Uh, usually get a nice big bunch sprint there and sprinters can have fun. We are going up the Camelberg from a different direction this year for the first time in a long, long time and the people in the area rank it as the hardest climb in the whole of Flanders, the whole of Belgium. So that tells you that it's not really going to be suitable for sprinters this season. Some sprinters might last the distance, real hard main sprinters like Christoph, but if you're wanting a sprint, E3 is going to be your race. So for sprinters teams, this is going to be their chance. They have to work a bit harder. So for me, it kind of makes the sprinters teams be more interested in this race, whereas before they would have said, oh, we'll have the sprint and get Bellingham on Sunday. It's not a problem. It looks like E3 is slightly more the favourite for a sprint. So I think sprinters teams are going to be more attentive and try to bring it back together. That contradicts my opening statement for this preview, by the way. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was a good question, Isaac. That was a See, very good question. I, I thought I'd let you go. Uh, next up, from the same uh, same guy, Aaron Sor. If you look at the three or four big teams, what's the hierarchy, in your opinion? Looking at Etix, Lotto, Trek, go on. Lotto... Benut for the break, Rollins for a, a smallish sprint, although Rollins can also attack. Etix, I uh, was definitely train, uh, sorry, Tertzra and Stiba for breakaway. I think Trent team for sprint, sorry, Tom. Trek, all in Cancellara, Stoyven, just in case something happens to Cancellara. Uh, and Sky, Roll Standard, Kwiatkowski, attacking all day long and just seeing who manages to get away. At GAD Son asks, my question for every couple race is, how big do you think the winning group is going to be? And we are already kind of goes into that. I say five, you say a larger group. What's a larger group for you? We got it totally wrong in Dwarf de Flandre for a start. Well, I think everybody got it wrong. Nobody predicted a sprint. Uh, I think last year we had three go over the quadrant together. This season I think it will be five or six. However, I do think it will slim down on the way into town and I think two men arrive together. On that note, guys, thank you very much for watching this preview of E3. Is Gen Velogen preview going to be tomorrow or in two days' time? Uh, two days' time, Saturday.
So on Saturday, come back for again Velo Game Preview, or you can just come back tomorrow and watch E3 here, and you can listen to David and I eat our words on Saturday when we totally got E3 wrong. So thank you guys very much for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.